This is Duke University. Hi, I'm Matthew Michelson, here with another episode of Office Hours. Professor Rohde, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to do it. All right, so let's start off with a few easy questions. Okay. Given Marco Rubio's debate performance last Saturday, how do you feel that will impact him in future primaries in different states? Do you really feel that this was the final nail in the coffin for him, given his poor performance in New Hampshire? I think that's pr probably too big an expectation from that. I, th I think the effects of these kinds of things tend to be more immediate than long term. Uh, be, uh, 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 and that's uh, merely because so many other things happen that uh, 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 subsequently that uh, mitigate the effects of that. So I've, it appears that the debate performance had a, a, a noticeable effect in the New Hampshire results. And that ha will have a continuing, or has, is having a continuing impact on, on Rubio. Um, uh, uh, especially because uh, what it did was create an opening for Kasich, for example, to make a much better showing than had been expected, a second place finish, pushed him ahead uh, uh, in the competition for the establishment wing support uh, in, the, in the party. Um, and Rubio finishing behind even Bush um, uh, raises questions about uh, what's going to happen in Florida when they face one another uh, just four weeks from now. So you spoke a little bit about the Republican Party establishment. Given Carly Fiorina and Chris Christie suspending their campaigns, do you think this will pave the way for uh, an, a candidate backed by the Republican Party elite to seriously challenge Donald Trump? Well, that, that's, that was, at least from the point of view of the establishment, the real downside of uh, the New Hampshire results because it leaves three viable candidates repeat, uh, 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 competing for that segment of party support, while uh, only two candidates are left uh, uh, representing the insurgents uh, in the party. And so um, um, given that it appears that the, the, uh, the set of voters who are responsive to that establishment segment of the party has declined substantially uh, in, in the last few years, um, uh, that, that's going to make it much more difficult for them to effectively compete uh, against Trump, particularly given the lay of the land of the next set of events. Um, so South Carolina, uh, uh, where uh, uh, there's no reason to expect that the three establishment candidates have an advantage over the insurgent candidates. And then Super Tuesday, which is uh, just a couple of weeks away, where there are 12 events that day and seven of them are in the South and, uh, and again, probably should advantage the insurgent candidates. So talking a little bit more about established candidates, in Iowa, Jeb Bush spent over $2,800 <laughs> per vote, <laughs> more than 18 times that of Ted Cruz, who ended up winning the Iowa caucus for the Republicans. Yeah. Do you feel that spending in primaries is sort of less important relative to general elections? Um, uh, I'm not sure you can say that. I, th I think that what you can say about both primaries and general elections is that m uh, uh, there's not a simple relationship between money and results. That is, that money doesn't just buy outcomes. It's not a bidding war. Um, it's absolutely clear from political science evidence that what candidates need in terms of financial resources is enough money to uh, make their case, to get themselves heard, to make themselves visible. Um, and once that's achieved, the relative uh, weight of more money versus less money is less important. Definitely. Do you think that um, Jeb Bush has often been chided for being too low energy? It's been very infamous in the news. Um, how would you advise him in terms of gaining some momentum for his campaign before it's too late? Well. I'm not sure. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, tr trying to alter your 
the, your basic characteristics is, is neither an easy or nor necessarily a fruitful thing for a candidate to do because it, it, it can make them look fake, it can make them look robotic like Marco, Marco Rubio, um, uh, things like that. So um, uh, it, it, it may simply be that this is a disadvantage that Bush will have to um, accept and internalize given the nature of this race, which is different from the races when he ran for governor and, and uh, the, what was on the people's mind, their attitudes, uh, the degree of anger, all of those things would, were different. And he was advantaged in those cases and he's disadvantaged uh, in, in, by that perhaps in this case. But that doesn't mean he automatically loses. Everybody has, all candidates have advantages and disadvantages and that, and some of them are more important than others in a given context. Speaking a little bit about how the political landscape has sort of shifted in recent years, in 2008, Hillary Clinton won New Hampshire in an upset in the primary, yet she wasn't able to cultivate that much support, only getting 38% of the total overall vote. Um, do you think that her message is sort of resonating differently in New Hampshire, or have recent scandals just plagued her to the extent that she wasn't able to sort of win New Hampshire? Uh, again, uh, um, uh, I suppose it's probably a combination of things in that, in the first place, it's eight years later. Uh, this is a different country. Uh, it's it's uh, the last time we were following on the heels of eight years of Republican presidency. Now we're following on eight years of the Democratic presidency. Um, uh, the, the issues are different. The relative importance of things is different. She's seen as an older, more routine candidate than uh, she, she was then. And then, of course, there are the scandals that are specific to, to this time around. And Bernie Sanders is a very different candidate with very different appeal given this particular context. And, uh, How do you think the role of superdelegates at the DNC will affect the race between Sanders and Clinton? I actually think uh, it, it, it's probably not going to be very consequential. Uh, um, and that's, uh, uh, that's contingent on a, a, a couple of caveats, so let me say those first. If the current race stays a two-person race between Sanders and Clinton, then I don't think it matters uh, very much, just like it didn't when it was a two-candidate race between Obama and Clinton. Um, uh, it's because the nomination is likely to be tied down long before the convention. Somebody, somebody will come out and be clearly ahead. I, my expectation is that we're very likely to have a Democratic nominee within six or eight weeks. Um, uh, uh, maybe a little longer than that, depending on vagaries. But it's the fact that it's a two-candidate race and that makes it unlikely that the superdelegates would be determinative. The historical pattern is that the, the superdelegates flock to the candidate that has basically already won the nomination. And, that. and um, um, most of Clinton's advantage uh, is merely because she was well known early and Sanders wasn't well known uh, early. And because Bernie is uh, much more to the extreme of the party than, uh, than she is. If he can prove by his performance in the primaries that he's the dominant candidate, the superdelegates will shift. Definitely. Um, in terms of um, the political landscape shifting and Bernie Sanders, he was the first Jew to win a presidential primary in this nation's history. Do you view that as sort of a more inclusive American political landscape? I'm not sure um, if it's more, I would say it's more inclusive, what I would say to simply say is that Jewishness is less relevant than, than it used to be. That is, I, th I think it's nowhere near the source of uh, discrimination to the degree it was even when I was young and, that, um, and much less earlier than that. I mean, it used to be the case that um, uh, uh, 
being Jewish was as, as strong a grounds for discrimination as being black or, or Latino. And I don't, I just don't think that's the case anymore. It's just not as important. Professor Rohde, thank you so much for joining us. Here we are with another episode of Office Hours. Produced by Duke University.